After having looked at what it means that two variables are statistically independent, we can now look more at the mixing and unmixing process. So this equation here, this equation here, um, formalizes the mixing process that is assumed uh, to have taken place. So what we get are the data x, so this is again a, a two-dimensional vector like s. s contains the statistically independent uh, variables s1 and s2, and x contains the mixture x1 and x2. m is a two-by-two two mixing matrix. The goal of ICA is to find a matrix U that performs an unmixing, so that turns X basically back into S, but we call it differently because it's fundamentally not possible to really recover S in an, any reliable way. But what we can achieve is that Y1 and Y2 are statistically independent. Uh, it's not possible to recover S exactly because, um, I mean, it's not clear uh, which of the two components should be the first one, right? So if we recover S2 and S1 rather than S1 and S2, that would also be a good solution, but would not be the same as S. And the scaling is undetermined, so if we scale a signal by 5 and the other by 10, they are still statistically independent, so the scaling is undetermined. So the only thing that we can try to achieve is statistical independence and by convention we normalize the uh, signals all to unit variance. But otherwise Y and S should be sort of apart from the permutation, so the switching of the components and the scaling, they should be identical. So in the following we usually assume that U will be the inverse of M, but that's generally not not the case. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so if we decompose this a little bit, okay, so we have the uh, component S1 and S2, and now I write M in terms of two column vectors, right? So and if we calculate this, um, if we calculate this product between a matrix and a vector, it turns out to be this one here. So we multiply the first component with the first column vector and the second component with the second column vector. So this is how the input data X is generated. Okay, so here's an example. And for the for simplicity, for the time being, we assume that D1 and D2 are normalized and orthogonal to each other. Right? That simplifies that simplifies matters quite a bit. Um, so here we see the distribution, which is uniform along D2, and it's peaky along D1. No. So if you go back, you see this distribution here. S2, along S2 we have a uniform distribution here, and along S1 we have a peaky distribution. And if we, if we take S1 and S2 and we simply multiply them with D1 and D2, here we get uh, this this distribution that's simply a rotation, right? So if we have two, if we have a matrix with two orthonormal vectors, that's an um, orthogonal matrix which performs a rotation. Okay, so this is a mixing process. Now the question is, how can we get back S1 and S2? Now it's uh, quite obvious. So this is a relatively simple situation and you can imagine if you have a vector um, 
So let's consider this data point that has projected down here that has this as one as one value and this as two value yeah and if you multiply as two which is this this part here with d2 you get exactly to this point and if you multiply s1 maybe i should write this down here so this would be s2 one no and if you multiply s2 with d2 you get this vector and if you multiply s1 with d1 you get this vector and if you add these two up you get back to this point and this is what this equation says Okay. Now, in order to extract S2, we simply have to project our data point onto the axis D2. So that's very simple. And that's shown here. So if we project X on, well, in this case, D1, um, we get the signal Y1 by definition, right? So this is, this is, um, simply the, our sort of unmixing process, but if you plug in x, we know x is s1 times d1 plus s2 times d2, and if you now rearrange this a little bit, so we move the, we move this d1 transpose into the parentheses basically, <coughs> because of the orthonormality of the d1 vector, this one equals 1, this one equals 0 because d1 and d2 are orthogonal to each other, this is 1 because the vector is normalized, so we are just left with s1, so in this case y1, the extracted y1 actually is identical to the original source s1. Um, so we do this for both components, for y1 and y2, which then allows us to combine the two vectors in a matrix U, which is our unmixing matrix. And as we already see here, if you multiply our unmixing matrix with a mixing matrix, which is D1 transpose, D2 transpose, multiplied with D1, D2, we spell it all out, we get here the normal norms of the two vectors and here the inner product of the two vectors since the vectors are orthogonal we get a zero hand zeros here and if since they are normalized we get ones here so that's very easy uh, so we know how to unmix a mixing if the mixing is done by an orthogonal matrix if it's just a rotation yeah. So basically U is the transpose of M. Now things become a bit more difficult if um, if the vectors are not orthogonal to each other. That's shown here. Um, so D1 is this vector and d2 is this vector, are neither orthogonal to each other, nor are they um, normalized. We see that the data distribution now has a bit more complicated, uh, complicated structure. Maybe I switch color here to show. So it obviously somehow lies between this side and this value, so that's the, that's sort of the uniform distribution along D2, yeah, 
So if you if you, if you move from here to here, there doesn't seem to be a change in density, but beyond the green line, there are no points. So this indicates a uniform distribution along this line. Yeah. While if we look at the first component that is a peaky distribution and with sort of, how should I draw this now? Sort of 95% intervals, let's say. Here or two sigma, something like that, between this and this. And the peaky distribution goes along this dimension. So, um, okay. So now there's there's this strange thing. that the variation caused by the first component goes in this direction and the borders sort of of the distribution in this direction they they are not orthogonal to that because they are actually determined by the d2 dimension right if you would assume that d2 would not vary at all the distribution would be completely on this line right d2 uh, sorry uh, if S2 would be 0 all the time, then the distribution would be here, because you multiply S2 with D2, and if S2 2 is 0, it, the whole distribution would be along this line. Now, the variation along these blue flanks here are caused by the variation of S2. Yeah. And that leads to this strange uh, parallelogram shape. Now... <coughs> If you want to extract the first component, this is maybe intuitively, one would first think, well, then, of course, we have to project our data onto the d1 direction. However, if we do that, pink here, if we do that and we take two points that are at the flank, at the two sigma distance, so basically with identical S1 values and we project them orthogonal onto the D1 axis, then we get two complete, quite different values, right? So that's not what we want. So rather than doing an orthogonal projection onto the D1 vector in order to extract S1, uh, it's important to actually ignore the S2 direction. And we can ignore the S2 direction by projecting along the D2 vector. So rather than an orthogonal projection, we do, we do, we have to do a projection that's along D2. We take these two vectors and we project them along D2. We get the same value in our um, D1 axis. And the vector that projects along D2 is our, is this E1 vector, right? Because that's orthogonal to D2. So that's the important aspect here, that E1, the vector that we need to extract, <coughs> extract the first component must be orthogonal to D2 and not in the direction of D1. And likewise, E2 must be orthogonal to D1. Yeah? That might be a bit counterintuitive. And if you go to high, higher dimensions, let's say if you go into a three-dimensional space, E1 must be orthogonal to, to D2 and 
d3 in order to ignore these components and then it will pick up uh, d1 or s1 rather. Okay, so that's spelled out here. Uh, well, actually I should go up, right? So here we have Oops. So this is a condition that must be fulfilled. So the E vectors that we use for the arm mixing for extracting the signal must be orthogonal to the other um, <coughs> vectors that have been used for, for mixing si the signals. And then in order to keep the scale, we assume here also that if you multiply E1 with d1 or e2 with d2 it will always be uh, normalized so and that leads to this equation with the Kronecker symbol. Kronecker symbol here Kronecker i j equals 1 if i and j are the same and equals 0 if they are different. Okay so if we assume now we have e1 and e2 with these properties we can define our unmixing matrix and if we multiply u with m, which is e1 transpose, e2 transpose, times d1, d2. Because of this Kronecker property, we get the identity matrix. Okay, so what's important here is, in order to do the unmixing, if the mixing was not just a rotation, we need vectors that are not aligned with the, uh, with the mixing vectors, but which are orthogonal to the other mixing vectors. So E1 should be orthogonal to D2 and D3, etc. In order to ignore those components and then it will be left only with the first component. Okay, so these are considerations that we can make if we know the mixing matrix. Now, but normally the mixing matrix is not known. Uh, so the question is, how can we find the unmixing matrix? There are generally two approaches to do that. So we already said, and we already talked quite a bit about this equation. So what we can do is we can try to rotate the data such that the components become statistically independent. Now that's the whole point so far. Um, <clears throat> so that uh, for the output signal y, the joint probability distribution of y1 and y2 equals the product of the marginal distributions p of y1 and p of y2. Since this usually can never be done exactly, you have to approximate this, so you want this to be almost equal, right? So we want the difference to be as small as possible. And there are different measures by which you can do this. One um, typical way to compare probability density functions is the Koberg Leibler divergence and you can sort of estimate the Koberg Leibler divergence between the joint probability distribution and the product of the marginals and you want that to be as close to zero as possible. I will talk about methods that are based on cross cumulants um, <coughs> which is a different approach. If you do that you always optimize the unmixing matrix as a whole. So it's not possible to um, to just extract one component and ignore the other one. I mean, it doesn't make much sense maybe in two dimensions, but in higher dimensions, although even in two dimensions, you can wonder uh, if you've found one extracting vector, the other could be at different angles, let's say. Yeah. <coughs> so in this approach, you optimize the whole unmixing matrix, matrix simultaneously. Now there's an alternative approach, um, and that's based on the, um, on the on the fact that if you mix random variables, the resulting probability density function of the mixture is typically more Gaussian than the distribution or is actually yeah, always more Gaussian than the distribution of the individual components. 
Um, so what you can do is you can try to find directions in which you pick up a signal that is as far away from Gaussian as possible. And if you do that, then that very likely is uh, an individual independent variable. And this is something that you can do one by one, right? That's called also the de deflation algorithm, where you first look for the direction which is least Gaussian, and then given that, you look for a direction that is sort of second least Gaussian, etc. And then if you have a, I don't know, 10 dimensional signal, you can stop this process after three iterations, and then you have three statistically independent um, signals, and you just don't care about the remaining seven ones, maybe. So there are two fundamentally different uh, approaches. The one is you try to make the components statistically independent, and in the other case you try, them, try to make them as non-Gaussian as possible. Um, and this approach, I will relate the two approaches, but I will not uh, um, talk much about this approach. Okay, I already explained that uh, sources <coughs> can only be recovered up to permutation and rescaling. Now that's that's again mentioned here. Now um, whiten the data first. So. <coughs> We have seen above that there's sort of a simple case where the, maybe I go up again, there's a simple case which is this one here, where the data has just been rotated, and let's assume for the time being that, uh, that S1 and S2 were also normalized. I said the scaling is sort of arbitrary, so we assume the scaling were normalized, and then this is just a rotation. And, um, and we have the more complicated case where they are not just rotated, but also sheared somehow. So now if S1 and S2 were normalized to unit variance, and they're statistically independent, then the covariance matrix is white. It's, uh, it's identity matrix, the covariance or second moment matrix, as we know it from principal component analysis. And if you rotate this, uh, it's still white. Now, it's, it, if you have a uh, if you have a white distribution or a sphered distribution, rotation doesn't change the second moment matrix. And furthermore, if you have two independent sources and they're normalized to one, the data are always sphered, right? They, it's quite obvious. I mean. So. If you have data that's normalized to one in this direction, it's normalized to one in this direction, then we know that the covariance matrix has the entries one and one in the diagonal. And if they are statistically independent, that means they are uncorrelated. So there are as many points here as they are here, and there are as many points as they are here. Or oh, there's at least we have a symmetry here, right? Um, actually, that depends, of course, on the on the on the um, distributions. But nevertheless, if they are statistically independent, they are uncorrelated. Uh, so we have zeros here. Okay, so the unit covariance matrix, and make this nicer. Uh, unit, so that means whitened data, <coughs> and if you rotate this, this doesn't doesn't change. Yeah. On the other hand, if the Covariance matrix is not the identity matrix. So let's assume, oh me, let me draw a new picture. 
So let's assume we have a covariance matrix. Might be 0 0.5, So what can you say about the statistical dependence of the variables if the covariance matrix is not the identity matrix? Well, from PCA we know that then basically the data distribution is somewhat distributed like this. Yeah? Variance in one direction and the other direction, while here it would be a circle. Circle, okay. Okay. A circle. Here you would you would um, you would have correlation this uh, this direction. And that definitely means the two variables are not statistically independent, right? So the, the least you would require from two variables to be statistically independent is that they are uncorrelated, right? Uncorrelated is a weaker statement than um, statistically independent and contained sort of in the statement that two variables are statistically independent. So it's a very good idea to widen the data because then at least the data are uncorrelated. They could still be not statistically independent uh, but at least they aren't correlated. That's the least you would require, right? So once you have whitened the data, you know that from then on it's only a matter of rotation to find statistically independent uh, um, signals. Yeah? So if you take this data distribution here and you whiten it, you actually get a shape like this. Maybe a different orientation, but the, the, the structure of the data would be exactly like the, this. And then we are sort of in the easy case where the extracting vectors are identical to the mixing vectors, and that means that they are orthogonal to each other. That's the important point, that we only need to do a rotation. We don't have to care about sort of some shearing and uh, stretching, at etc. It's only a matter of rotation. Okay, so now let me, let me, okay, so why, why can data that's uncorrelated be still statistically independent? Well, a very simple example is actually if you take, if you assume that the data actually lies on the circle, yeah? Now, by this argument that we had earlier, that if you know the value, um, if you know one value, it tells you something about the other value. Uh, if you assume that S2, has this value, S2 has this value, then you know that S1 must have either this value because uh, through or this value, while if S1 has this value, Two can have either this value or this value. Yeah. So data that's just lying on a circle is uncorrelated, but is not statistically independent. I mean, in this case, there's no way to make them statistically independent. Uh, you, you can rotate them any way you like. You don't change the distribution. But this, for example. Um, would be a case, I mean, it's hard to see, it looks like there is a um, correlation in this direction, but there are some, maybe I should draw more points, but there are also points far out here and far out there. So overall, there's no correlation in this, uh, but still, they're statistically dependent, right? So the distribution uh, of x1 depends on the knowledge of x Sorry, the distribution of x1 depends on the knowledge of x. Sorry, the distribution of x2 depends on the um, knowledge of the value of x1, for instance. Okay, so... We are here. Okay, so we, we have, have now argued that if you, the, the least you, that you would expect from two variables that are statistically independent is that they are uncorrelated, 
And if you widen the data, you decorrelate the data. They are uncorrelated, and they are uncorrelated in any orientation. So the only thing that's left to be done in order to find the most statistically independent variables is to rotate the data, which also means that the extracting vector then becomes orthogonal. So that's very handy. Okay, so knowing all this, we, this we can now formulate a generic ICL algorithm, which goes as follows. So the first step is to um, remove the mean. Okay, I haven't talked about removing the mean. Um, if the data has mean, hmm, maybe I should say a word about that. If the if the data lies some whoops if the data lies somewhere here, right? I mean then there's a strong dependency. Um no. Okay. So for the for the property of being statistically dependent or not, the mean does not matter. Um however, for the algorithm uh, because of the whitening, that's a process that that sort of requires to remove the mean. Uh, it's very convenient to remove the mean first. Yeah. So me removing the mean is sort of part of the whitening process. Because for statistical ind independence, it doesn't really matter, right? Okay, so let's assume we have data that lies, well, right, we had this data earlier as an example of statistically independent variables. But if we now take the box to be here, it's the same, right? It's again two statistically independent variables the one with a uniform distribution along this interval and the other one with a uniform distribution along this interval. So for the issue of statistical independence, it does not matter, but for whitening, we want to remove the mean. So remove the mean and whiten the data. And then we know that all that's being left to be done is uh, rotate the data, and we can do this, uh, and, and we can do this either to um, find signals that are as statistically independent as possible, for instance, by comparing the joint probability distribution with the product of the marginals, or we can look for components that are as non-Gaussian as possible. So these are the two possible approaches. 